Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis Sim Technologies and welcome to this latest Chassis Sim video tutorial and today ladies and gentlemen what we're going to be talking about is something that's been very long overdue for me to cover and that's circuit modeling connecting the dots. Now to set the tone for our discussion today creating circuits is something that can be easily done in Chassis Sim and indeed if you go to the Chassis Sim YouTube channel you're going to find a whole playlist about all the mechanics about how you go about creating a circuit in Chassis Sim what knobs to press, etc., etc. The purpose of our discussion today is to show you how to connect the dots because over the last decade and a half of me watching um, customers, students um, put all this together, the big area where they come unstuck is while they know the mechanics of what buttons to press, what a lot of people lack is how to connect the dots, and that's what we're going to be discussing at length in this tutorial today. So let's get stuck into it. Okay, first things first, let's talk about the components of a chassis sim circuit model. Now, this is actually really, really interesting because what I'm about to discuss is the thing that makes chassis sim very fundamentally different from its contemporaries because unless you've been living under a rock for the last um, decade and a half, the thing that makes chassis sim unique is that the lap time simulation in chassis sim is fully transient. There are no pseudo-static components whatsoever. So the sort of approaches that you would come from the pseudo-static world isn't going to work exactly the same way as it, do as it does with chassis sim because of the fact it's, um, uh, it's totally transient. But, so the core of a chassis sim circuit model is a curvature file, a bump profile that you'll generate in about five minutes at a stroll. What you then need to do is the next component is the altitude road camber file. And don't worry, we'll talk about how these bits and pieces fit together uh, momentarily. The bump scale vector file, which is there to refine the bumps, and that's a reflection of the fact that um, the bumps, uh, uh, the bump uh, modeling in chassis sim isn't perfect. And also, too, like anything in life, chassis sim in and of itself is not perfect. And for me to pretend that it was perfect would be completely dishonest. And the last aspect is the grip scale factor. And there's a very deliberate reason I've listed it in that order. Okay, what to modify and where to change it. And that is this is so key. Okay, so for corner speeds where the delta is greater than about 20k an hour, your first go-tos on this are your altitude road camber file and then your bump scale factor. Now, anyone who has spent more than about five minutes doing ovals knows that the millisecond you've got banking, it has a huge impact in terms of what your corner speeds are going to be doing. Like even the place like Indianapolis, where you've only got 10 degrees worth of banking, it's still going to make its presence well and truly um, felt. So consequently, when you don't, uh, so when you start to see big corner speeds to var variation, particularly when you're seeing about more than about 20k an hour, your first question is altitude road camper. Now, what do you do when you don't have data? Guess what, folks? Here is where YouTube is your greatest friend, because chances are some go uh, 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 a sub club runner has been with a GoPro in a circuit of your choice, and you can see very, very quickly if you've got altitude road camber numbers that you um, need to be dealing with. But more often than not, what has happened with chassis sim is it's tripped over a bump. This is particularly apparent in the long sweeping um, corners, and that's when you start playing around with bump scale factors. So a good rough rule of thumb to start is about 0.7 or so. We work you through that um, with um, the chassis sim bootcamp. That combination of the altitude road camber file and the bump scale factor file typically will get you to within a delta of about 10k an hour, if not five kilometers an hour. And that really speaks volumes to the veracity and the power of the transient simulation approach for lap time simulation. Because all of a sudden, the crutch that you would lean on for grip scale factors that you would in pseudo-static simulation evaporates when you're dealing with a tool like chassis sim because now you're taking in the full gambit of what is um, uh, going on. And this leads me to my next point, is that when you go to a delta of about 5k an hour, this is when you play around grip scale factors. Now, the question needs to be asked, where do we need to tune? What section of the circuit do we need to tune? Because I discussed this in um, the earlier videos on the chassis sim circuit playing list about the mechanics of how to do um, bump scale factors, grip scale factors, etc., etc. Where you modify this is the turn in to mid corner section 
of um, the circuit. That's where you focus your distance um, channel. This is where you focus your distance channel on. And in particular, I give you a really good hands-on example of that in Chassis Sim uh, 101, where I talk, where we use. It's a very abridged version of um, the the first day of the Chassis Sim boot camp, where I talk about what you actually modify. But here's the thing, because if you get the mid corner speed in Chassis Sim right. Everything else will flow downstream because what the um, cornering algorithm in Chassis Sim is doing is it's using a steady state velocity from the start of your turn in to the end of your mid corner section. So this is where you will be focusing on putting in your bump scale factors. It's also where you'll be focusing on putting your altitude road camber file. And it'll also be where you're going to put your grip scale factor file. And that's where I see a lot of people, particularly those people who haven't attended the boot camps, tend to trip up a bit. So that's a really, really important thing to note. Okay, curvature file tips and tricks. Okay, so there are a couple of things. The big thing you're going to be playing with is the filtering settings, as you can see right here. So you've got two options to play with. You've got a frequency-based filter or a moving average-based filter. Now, if you've got a really good quality um, accelerometer, like for example, the TechSense um, Tri-Axis G meter is excellent. And you've pretty much mounted that at or near the center of gravity, by all means use the frequency filtering. Sadly, most accelerometers that you'll get from most data acquisition packages, like from club level, even to levels like Formula 4, typically will have the accelerometer just put willy-nilly in the box. Um, so consequently, in that sort of situation, the most reliable is to move to the moving average filter, which I have here. Now, one thing that I will say, when you're starting creating curvature files in Chassis Sim, I would actually recommend starting on the moving average filter because it's pretty much bulletproof and use a time content of about 0.5. It just removes any unwanted spikes. It also gives Chassis Sim a firm target on what to hit. So that's a so this is something we talk about at the bootcamp um, at length, but I really thought the time is now to really kind of make you a little bit more aware of it because I've just seen so many people trip over this. Okay, bumps, uh, bump profile tips and tricks. Now, the two big things that you'll be playing around to um, refine the bump profile uh, is um, these things in the red boxes. So the maximum bump rate and the auto bump scaling. Now, maximum bump rate, that will vary depending. It's, it's sort of a filtering to make sure you don't get any erroneous data in there. Now, as a rough rule of thumb, for um, your open wheelers, um, sports cars, you're typically looking at about 0.2 of a meters per second. When you do that, it pretty much cuts out the crap that you'll um, get um, uh, from uh, damper data. For touring cars, like we're talking TCRs, we're talking Trans Am, uh, V8 supercars, you can go to about um, uh, 0.3. The other thing too is um, this, little uh, uh, this little tab here, allow auto bump scaling. What that does is it takes the base bump profile and does a bunch of track replays to really refine um, uh, to really refine the magnitude of uh, the bumps. So as a rough rule of thumb, that works out really, really well at about three or so. So that's where I tend to, uh, that's where I tend to use it. It will vary from car to car, but three is a good number to start going. Also too, the other thing here, and I realize this is kind of teaching everyone how to suck eggs, um, but if you click here to specify the bump profile location, that allows you to specify where you want the bump profile, where, where you want the bump profile um, uh, to go. Now, you'll see in the Chassis Sim 101 video, I will initially put my curvature file, my bump profile, my altitude road camper file, and my grip scale factor file in the same directory as the car file. And when you're starting, I strongly, strongly advise um, that you do that because to quote um, an old dance uh, an old dance teacher of mine, you've got to know what the rules are before you start breaking them. And that's a really good um, case in point. Okay, altitude road camper tips and tricks. Now, the thing about altitude road camper is, as I said before, anyone who spent more than five minutes on an oval knows what a huge impact this is gonna have. Also too, if you've been to a place like Spa, the Nordschleifer, you'll really see just what a big impact that the altitude road camber variation will have. So um, first things first, when you're importing GPS altitude, and, and make no mistake, the GPS altitude and incorporating AZ in the monster file has pretty much rendered the auto uh, the auto road um, uh, the auto altitude road camber file pretty much redundant. 
Um, and one of these things I was probably never really 100% happy with anyway, but that's by the by. So with GPS altitude, make sure it's filtered and it starts and stops at the same point. Now, the reason you've got to make sure it's filtered and it starts and stops at the same point is that with GPS, uh, with um, GPS, you are always at the mercy of the supply satellites. So you're going to get signal dropouts and it's never going to be an exact uh, match. And indeed, one of the big, big things that's really disturbed me about this business is the amount of people who are leaning on GPS, out, uh, on, uh, GPS speed and using GPS for circuit maps. That is just wrong on so many um, different levels, but we'll cover that another day. Now, AZ in the monster file. Make sure this is filtered to 10 hertz. The reason you want this filtered um, uh, to 10 hertz is that what typically happens when you get an AZ trace is that you've got a lot of high frequency behavior in that AZ trace, and that pretty much incorporates the car going over bumps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You don't want that high frequency information for generating um, road camber. All of your road camber pretty much happens at a frequency of about five hertz or less. So the reason you want to go to ten hertz is that you want to. It's basically down to Nyquist frequency. You really want to make sure you want to cut out the crap, uh, the high frequency crap, so you can basically focus on what's important. So I cannot stress that um, point enough. The other thing too that I'd recommend you do is is zero AZ on the ground. It just it makes things a lot nicer. Um, also, too, when you do this, make sure you import the GPS altitude first. Now, the, the exception to the rule is ovals because most ovals you'll deal with are at sea level and your altitude variation, like for a, um, for a, um, for a, for a oval, is pretty, much is, is pretty much negligible. The dominant factor will be the circuit banking. I will say this, um, with regards to the AZ um, in the monster file at 10 hertz, the exception that proves the rule to this is a place like Daytona, where you've got a lot of um, uh, where you've got a lot of local variation of um, the road camber, but effectively the bump profiling kind of will tidy that up for you. So I wouldn't get overly, particularly for those of you running on ovals, I wouldn't be particularly losing sleep over that. Okay, a last thing that I want to talk about is a little hack when you need to nail the bumps. So when you when nailing the bumps is an absolute priority, when you really need to have that bump profile, uh, that um, uh, when you need to have the bumps absolutely nailed, or when you've got a situation where you're starting to apply bump scale factors of about 0.5 and it's not looking right, this is where you can play with force factor filtering. So the way you get it, to, uh, you get it to do is that you bring up the simulation window. So you click here on advanced options. Then you click here to allow force factor filtering. Now, a good rule of thumb to get started is about oh, uh, it's a time constant of about 0.075. Now, what that does is for the mid corner, it just takes the spikes off um, uh, the force factor determination in chassis sim and gives you a much um, uh, smoother picture. So, when you really need to nail the bumps going uh, uh, um, uh, going over, um, if you and if you've got a situation where the cornering speeds aren't matching up for love or money. This is a really good go-to. Now, rough rule of thumb, and this is uh, now again, just to sort of cycle back here, the reason that we've got bump scale factors um, in chassis sim is twofold. Number one, to cover you for the fact that um, the chassis sim bump profiling is not perfect. And I'm not gonna, uh, and I'm not gonna uh, put my hands up and say that chassis sim is perfect. For me to do so would be a little bit like saying the denial is a river in Egypt. That being said, we, again, where you use bump scale factors is where you're tripping over a bump. But also, too, you could be in a situation where the corner and speeds are down like 20, 30k an hour, and you take a look at the bumps, and you see a situation where the actual magnitude of the bumps, 20 to 30k lower, are actually the same as when, there's 20 to, uh, when the actual speed is 20 to 30k hour. Now, that is your uh, cue to use bump scale factoring. And conversely, if you've got a situation where chassis sim is blasting through that corner, say 10 to 20k an hour faster, and you're looking at the bumps, and the actual bumps are um, and the actual bumps are oscillating much more, the actual dampers are oscillating much more than the simulator bumps, then you flip the other side of the bump scar factoring and you and you go for bump scar factors greater than one. Like in that situation, you'd be looking at about uh, about 1.2, 1.3. And you'll see it straight away in terms of when you start um, doing your overlays because it will show up as plain as day on um, the damper pots. 
Okay, what to do when things go bang. Now, sometimes you're going to be in a situation where you go through, you do your circuit modeling, you create your curvature file, your bump profile, you tune in where your bump scale factors are, etc., etc., and you get to a situation where the cornering speeds are just batching up for love or money. Now, when you get to this situation, the, time, the actual car model itself is off. In particular, the common culprit that you'll see is this sort of situation. This is actually something that we teach in the chassis and boot camps. And typically what we have is this is our um, F3 car at Zandvoort. So have a look at the tire model here from about 307, uh, vertical load of about 378 kilos down to about 600. Notice how the tire model is dropping off in terms of grip. Now, if we take a look at the turn six example at Zandvoort, and typically like I work the students through, it starts off at about, um, uh, it starts off at a mid corner speed of 170, 180 when we do a bit of bump scale, fa uh, when we do the altitude row camber factor, then we do bump scale factor, it goes up to 190. And you kind of play a little bit with bump scale factor, but you never get it quite there. And then what I do is I use a tire modeling from nothing approach and all of a sudden, boom, it matches up straight away. The reason it's matching up straight away is we take a look at the simulated tire loads going through there. It's now 515 kilos. So that means we're in this region of the tire where the tire grip is, is matching up. So you can throw all the bump scale, grip scale factors that you want at that until the cows come home. And it's not going to do, it's it's not going to do anything. Indeed, it'll throw everything else off. So when you see a situation like that, always go back to this sort of situation. Indeed, that's why the tire force modeling um, approach from nothing is such a powerful technique. And indeed, I would refer you to look at that. Um, uh, I would refer you onto that um, video. So to sum up, okay, creating circuit models is not as hard as you think. Indeed. If I have $5 for the amount of times I get asked, oh, do you have a circuit model for this? Do you have a circuit model for that? I tell you what, I would not be here speaking with you good folk today. I would be retired as a multi, multi-millionaire, as a gentleman of leisure, living in a subtropical paradise, living the life of Riley. But I am here, but, but alas, that is not the case. I am here talking to you good folk. So what you've just got to do, though, is you've got to do it in a particular order and be systemized about it. That's all you've got to do. Also, too, you need to know where the hacks are. Once you know what the hacks are, it all comes together very, very quickly. And once you know all that, you'll be generating models instinctively. And indeed, you'll probably get to the point where you'll be punching out circuit models in about half hour, 20, uh, about you know, 20 minutes, half an hour at that. So, however, don't take my word for it. If you're an existing Chassim customer, put this into practice. But if you're not a Chassim customer, sign up to our online simulation. Take this for a spin. And we'll catch you in the next episode of Dan's Vehicle Dynamics Corner or the next Chassis Sim video tutorial.